they are elected by you i am elected by you i'm constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place the founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens they didn't want one person one man to have all the power like a king we show by our work that free people can govern themselves. You can't pay lip service to the Constitution without obeying it. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is, uh, structure is destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article I Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. The following episode of the Necessary and Proper podcast was recorded on September 19th at the St. Thomas School of Law student chapter on the topic of the Electoral College. We hope you enjoy. Um, Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to our second Federal Society event of the semester. My name is Haley Howe. I'm the president of our student chapter. Um, Today, we're very excited to have Professor Richard Duncan from the Nebraska College of Law, as well as Professor Gordon providing commentary on <laughs> uh, why Wyoming ma- still matters, the Senate Electoral College and government by national consensus. Uh, briefly, just as a flag, our next event will be October 22nd with Shelby Emmett from the Center for Prof- uh, from the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, she'll be speaking on uh, free speech versus hate speech. October 22nd, same room, same time. Please come. Um, and brief overview, uh, Professor Duncan is the Welton and Wise Professor of Law at the Nebraska College of Law. Um, he's a graduate of Cornell Law School. He was an editor of their law review. Um, he teaches constitutional law with an emphasis on religious freedom and federalism uh, and has published on Scalia's Legacy, the Electoral College of Federalism, um, and Masterpiece Cake Shop. And he has five children and is married and loves lifting weights and reading novels of Charles Dickens and loves Hamilton. Um, And um, for anyone who has not yet met Professor Gordon, he is a um, a lawyering skills professor. He teaches comparative constitutional law um, and also has a master's in public policy from the um, Humphrey Institute. So uh, thank you so much and let's welcome Professor uh, Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be back here. I've got many friends on the uh, the faculty here, and one of my good friends, Mike Paulson, unfortunately is also on the road today, so I didn't get a chance to say hi to Mike. Uh, one one thing that you, uh, Haley mentioned Hamilton. Now I've been to Hamilton nine times. Um, at four times in New York and five times in Chicago. I'm working on Omaha. They're in Omaha right now. Uh, so I think that's a Nebraska record, so I think I'm in the record books uh, for <laughs> Hamilton. And it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here at St. Thomas. Uh, Professor Gordon and I have already had the, de- the debate. I, I, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get up here in time because we were in the middle of having a very pleasant discussion about some of these issues. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here at St. Thomas for this event concerning the structural provisions of the Constitution and federalism. And I, I will focus today on how the constitutional architecture gives to the states and to we the people in the several states the power to protect liberty by controlling the selection of those who would wield authority in all three branches of the national government. So let me say at the outset, I completely understand that some citizens and many constitutional scholars, this has actually become a very hot issue in the last couple of years. Uh, Many constitutional scholars have a strong preference for a a unitary national election for the presidency, one in which the president would be elected not in state elections as today, but in a national election in which the winner of a majority of the national popular vote or at least of a plurality of the national popular vote, would win the presidency. I get that. It is one reasonable view of how we should elect the president. Uh, It views America as one giant coast-to-coast nation rather than as a federal republic of 50 states. But if we went that way, we may also have to learn to live with presidents who get a plurality much lower than 49.9%. 
in a popular election with three or four candidates, the popular vote plurality winner might get as little as 43% of the vote as Bill Clinton did in 1992. But Clinton won a 68% electoral vote majority in the states in 1992, 370 for Clinton and 168 for the elder Bush, which gave Clinton's 43% plurality the legitimacy of an electoral landslide. So my purpose here today is to defend the enduring system of structural federalism uh, created by our Constitution, one which seeks to protect the liberties of we the people in the several states, not we the people writ large, but we the, the people in our several states, by decentralizing the selection process for those who would wield the incredible power of the national government under Articles 1, 2, th and 3 and the Supremacy Clause. So let me start with a quote from the late, great Justice Scalia. He said this, the fragmentation of power produced by the structure of our government is central to liberty, and when we destroy it, we place liberty at peril. Uh, a lot of students tend to view constitutional law as the, the kind of boring structural provisions and the exciting Bill of Rights liberty provisions, but actually more liberty is protected by the structural provisions of the Constitution than is protected by the individual rights. As much as I love the Bill of Rights, they don't protect as much liberty as the structural provisions of the Constitution do. So I, I want to start by emphasizing that America is a federal republic, not a unitary democratic nation. We have no national elections in America. We have state elections for national office. Every election is held in the states. Congress is elected in districts in the states, and members represent not America, but the citizens who reside, who reside in their individual districts in their particular state. Senators are elected in the states, and each senator represents the citizens of his or her particular state. And there is no popular election for the president. Rather, there are 50 separate state elections for presidential electors from each state. So there is no such thing under the Constitution as a national popular vote. The media writes stories about the popular vote, but they do that only by adding up the popular votes in each of the 50 state elections. So for example, in 2016, President Trump won 30 of the 50 Democratic state elections by winning the popular vote in 30 states. Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote in only 20 states plus the District of Columbia. And this is not some obsolete system from the distant past. It may be more relevant now in today's divided states of America, as Time Magazine calls our nation than it was at the founding. It is designed to protect the federal republic and to ensure that the national government is one that requires a national multi-regional consensus among we the people in the several states. So once you understand the purpose of the electoral vote system to ensure that a successful candidate must want a consensus among the states rather than run up the score in one or two mega states, then you can embrace the electoral system as in Hamilton's words, excellent. So let's go back to 1787. Constitutional convention is getting underway. And we've got 13 sovereign states that are loosely together under the Articles of Confederation, but they still have a great deal of sovereignty. Some of these states are large population states like Virginia. Some of these states are small population states like, De like Connecticut and Delaware. And the people in these states were being asked to ratify a constitution pursuant to which they would yield some of their sovereignty to a new national government, a new, more powerful national government under a supremacy clause that makes clear that laws en enacted by the national government will be supreme, will trump inconsistent state laws. So if you think about the Constitution was conceived and negotiated under the shadow of the supremacy clause, whatever we give up, we're not getting back. Whatever we give up, we are subjecting ourselves to this new national government. So if you were a delegate from a large population state, like Virginia or New York or Pennsylvania, you would want elections for national offices that favored the large population states. But suppose you were a delegate from a small population state, such as Connecticut or Delaware. What would you demand as the price of your state ratifying the new constitution and submitting to national authority? 
You would want equal representation in Congress as you had under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and, and with respect to the election of president, you probably would also want state equality. One state, one vote was the goal, was the goal of the small states. And as you read through the Constitution, that idea of state equality is a, is a common theme that runs throughout all of the structural provisions of the original Constitution. The small population state had a legitimate fear of political domination by the larger states, and they required some kind of structural self-defense mechanism to be part of the new Constitution. And remember, under Article 7 of the Constitution, a lot of people don't even know there is an Article 7 of the Constitution, although the Constitution would go into effect when nine of the 13 states ratified it. It would only be effective between states so ratifying it. Thus, only states that ratified the Constitution would be part of the United States. If the Union were to be achieved, the Constitution had to work for each of the original 13 states, whether large or small or in between. Here's my new favorite founding father, Gunning Bedford of Delaware. I'd never heard of him until I started doing some research on these issues. At the Constitutional Convention, he's got a great name too, Gunning Bedford. Uh, Gunning Bedford, the delegate from Delaware, responded to charges that the small states were being unreasonable. Sound familiar? By stating that the large states are seeking an enormous and monstrous influence, and continued. They, that is the large states, insist that although the powers of the general government will be increased, yet it will be for the good of the whole. And although the three great states form nearly a majority of the people of America, they will never hurt or injure the lesser states. And then he looked at his fellow delegates and said, I do not, gentlemen, trust you. You kind of love this guy. So the Senate was created to give each state equal representation in one house of Congress, in the Senate. Large population states get two senators, and small population states get two senators. The large population states get, a, get something too. They get proportional representative in the House of Representatives. And again, the small states have equal representation in the Senate. And the Electoral College was formed as part of the great compromise between the large and small states. And each state gets a number of electoral votes based upon its total representation in Congress, House plus Senate. So the first thing I want to do, though, is talk a little bit about the Senate and, uh, um, and equal suffrage in the Senate. And Grover Norquist has a great uh, line about Wyoming and uh, its representation in the Senate. No Norquist says, Wyoming is a state with a population of three citizens, two of whom are United States senators, and the other one is a member of Congress. Uh, and those might be the two senators right there in the middle of the road, I'm not sure. They wouldn't be in the middle of the road. They wouldn't be in the middle of the road. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the Senate and the text of the Constitution. Uh, Article 1, Section 3 says, The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof, that's changed, for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. So a few quick points about how the Senate was created by the original Constitution. First, notice that each state is given equal representation in the Senate. Today, California, with 37 million residents, gets two senators, and Wyoming, with a population of about 500,000 residents, gets two senators. The Senate is a wonderful thing for federalism and the recognition of regional differences in the several states and of state equality. And notice the gunning Bedfords of the world weren't fools. Article 5, the, the article of the Constitution dealing with amendments, provides that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. So you can't take equal representation in the Senate away from any state, not even by a constitutional amendment, unless the state consents. Will Wyoming ever consent to getting less than equal suffrage in the Senate? It will never happen. The two Senate, the, the equal suffrage in the Senate rule is, is unamendable. It is a permanent fixture 
of the constitutional structure. And this, by the way, again, was the great compromise between the small states and the big states, a compromise that made it possible for the original Constitution to be ratified by the states. Delaware, Connecticut, Rhode Island, they would have walked away unless they got something like this. Big states got proportional representation in the House, and small states got equal representation in the Senate. Second point about the original Senate. Notice that the original Constitution provided that the United States Senators were to be chosen not by the people in an election, but by the state legislature of each state. And then along came the 17th Amendment, ratified in 1913 at the height of the progressive era, which provides that the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, that hasn't changed, elected by the people thereof for six years. So the 17th Amendment says, from now on, senators shall be elected by the voters of each state rather than by the legislatures of each state. So first, a brief word about the 17th Amendment. Before the 17th Amendment, again, senators were selected by state legislatures, and they served almost like ambassadors of each state to a foreign government, sort of like the Chinese ambassador to the United States. Here you had the Delaware ambassador to, you know, to Congress, basically, to the United States. After the 17th Amendment, senators still represent their states as co-equal societies, in the words of Madison. Uh, but now, as chosen by what Madison called the supreme authority in each state, the people of each state. So the 17th Amendment deprived state legislatures of some power, and this may have been particularly important in allowing Congress to grasp additional power under the Commerce Clause and the Spending Clause during the New Deal era. But it gave we the people of each state an equal voice in one house of Congress, and thus ensures that the Senate will continue to be an institution that protects federalism and liberty in the states. But in any event, true federalism is not about states' rights and the powers and prerogatives of state legislatures. It is about individual liberty and choice and competition among the states for consumers of government. The Constitution was negotiated, as I said, under the shadow of the supremacy laws. One size fits all national laws can be imposed on the states and upon we the people in the states by Congress. Equal suffrage in the Senate is a check on the power of Congress to impose its will on the states. It gives the people of each state, no matter how large or how small the state, an equal voice in one house of Congress and requires effectively a majority of the states as opposed to a national popular majority to enact federal law. Makes it that much more difficult for Congress to impose its will on the states. And when Congress does an act, the states are free to go in different directions. California can have laws that meet the needs of Californians, and Wyoming can have laws that meets the needs of Wyomingers? <laughs> of bison. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, equal suffrage in the Senate also requires a consensus among the states before treaties. The Senate is given extra powers that the House doesn't have. So it requires a consensus uh, among the states before treaties can take effect or federal judges or officers can be confirmed. And I believe the Senate's check on presidential judicial nominations is particularly important for liberty in the states. Equal suffrage in the Senate and the Senate's power to confirm judicial appointments is, again, another self-defense mechanism that requires a consensus among the states before judges, and thus judicial decisions changing the meaning of the Constitution, can be Im imposed on the people in the states, on the people of Texas or Wyoming or Nebraska or North Dakota or Minnesota. And how we ended up with Justice Gorsuch rather than Justice Garland is a recent example of how the Senate gives the states the power to protect themselves from the judiciary. Obama lost the Senate in 2014. Presidential elections have consequences, but so too do senatorial elections. And Mitch McConnell and the Republican majority in the Senate checked Obama's power to confirm a liberal major majority on the court by replacing Justice Scalia, uh, by flipping that seat, replacing Justice Scalia with a liberal justice. Garland would have been the fifth liberal vote on the court. And red state senators said no to Obama's ability to ensure a liberal majority on SCOTUS for many years to come. Basically, they said, let's let the people decide in the election of 2016. Again, the shadow of the supremacy clause and the court's power to impose its will on all 50 states 
requires that the states have some defensive capability to protect their reserve powers under the 10th Amendment. A president needs a consensus among the states in the Senate to ensure his judicial nominations are confirmed. Unless you think this is a partisan issue. This in part explains why President Reagan failed to get Judge Bork confirmed in 1987. Reagan lost the Senate and the Senate stopped the Bork nomination. So you need, you know, you, elections have consequences, presidential elections, but also senatorial elections. And the only time judicial confirmations are easy is when the presidency and the Senate are in the hands of people from the same party. When you have divided government, then, then judicial confirmations can be checked. So now let's talk about the electoral vote system for the presidency. The Senate is very interesting, and you know, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, progressives are campaigning against the Senate. And they're saying, well, California should have proportional representation in the Senate. Think about that for a minute. If Wyoming gets two senators and California has roughly 35, has roughly 70 times the population of Wyoming, how many senators would California get? That's pretty simple math. 140. Think about that. Just, just think about 140 United States senators from the state of California and how that would change the way we're governed at the national level. Um, so again, we're, now let's talk about the presidency. Interestingly, most of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention believe that after George Washington, who had overwhelming support, it would be rare that a presidential candidate would win a majority of electoral votes. The framers thought 19 of 20 elections would be decided not by the electoral vote majority, that in 19 of 20 elections, no candidate would receive an electoral vote majority. And I think they were assuming that this is before the two-party system had you know, really taken effect. And they were assuming that each state would basically nominate its favorite son. New York would nominate Hamilton. Virginia would, represent, would nominate uh, uh, Jefferson. Uh, Pennsylvania would, would nominate somebody like Ben Franklin, and none of them would win a electoral college majority. It would know, be kind of a tie of 13. Every state would have its own favorite son, and no one would win the presidency in the electoral college. So what happens if no one wins an electoral college majority? Well, if no candidate wins an electoral college ma majority, the Constitution says the election is decided in the House of Representatives so California gets 55 votes, or 53 in the House? No. Each state delegation gets one vote. It's decided in the House, but each state delegation gets one vote. So the 53 congressmen and women from California, they caucus, and they decide how to cast California's one vote. And then the one congressman from Wyoming has a little conference with himself. You know, he kind of goes back and forth, and then he decides or she decides how to cast Wyoming's vote. State equality, once again, state equality. Equality among the small states and the large states is baked into the structural provisions of the Constitution. So although the electoral, let me just grab a quick sip of water here before I go on to the next point. Although the electoral system is often attacked as anti-democratic, California doesn't get, you know, doesn't, doesn't get to, to vote its popular votes in a national election, so it's anti-democratic. The real issue is not democracy, but rather whether the presidential election should be federally democratic or nationally democratic. The presidential elections in each of the 50 states are as democratic as any elections you would want to be. They are federally democratic. Each voter in each state election gets one vote, and each vote counts the same within each state. The purpose of having individual states decide electoral votes is to require a candidate to appeal to the citizens in many states across the country in multiple regions, representing people with a diversity of values and ideas about the good life. And to ensure that the small states have an important role in electing the president. In other words, the electoral sy system functions as a counterweight against the powerful forces of nationalization of law and politics. In the words of Martin Diamond, when all forces tend to homogenization and centralization, we have a saving remnant of decentralization in the federal aspect of the election of the American president. The Constitution's structural 
uh, provisions regarding electoral federalism ensure that the states and we the people in the states have a vital role in selecting all three branches of the national government. The Senate, state equality, the president through the electoral vote system, and the judiciary because both the president and the Senate uh, have a check on one another and, and, you know, the, and, and the states are choosing who's the president and who are the senators from each state. So every national officer really is, is elected in the states and, 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 and is the product of a consensus in the states. Well, let's talk a little bit about Alexander Hamilton. That's how I picture him. <laughs> at Federalist number 68, Alexander Hamilton praised the electoral system as one if it be not perfect is at least excellent. And here's how Hamilton explained the excellence of the electoral system for electing the president. The process, he, this guy would have wrapped it, but Hamilton wasn't quite as cool. The process of election affords a moral certainty that the office of president will never fall to the lot of any man who is not in an eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications. Talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity may alone suffice to elevate a man to first honors in a single state, but it will require other talents and a different kind of merit to establish him in the esteem and confidence of the whole union or of so considerable portion of it, here's the consensus, as would be necessary to make him a successful candidate for the distinguished office of President of the United States. In other words, election to the presidency requires a multi-regional consensus among the states and among we the people in the several states. The road to the White House passes through the states. The people of Wyoming may be few in number, but on election day, they get to determine who wins the three electoral votes that Wyoming is allocated. Regardless of what happens in California, the people of Wyoming get to determine who wins their state's three electoral votes. Moreover, the political benefits of electoral system federalism do not depend, as some people say, well, Duncan, um, your system's not working that well because candidates, you know, they don't, they don't bother to campaign in Nebraska. They just campaign in the swing states. Well, that may be true. Uh, but the political benefits don't depend upon which candidates physically campaign or where candidates physically campaign or where they place political advertisements. That's a boon for the local economy. But it has nothing to do with protecting federalism. The benefits that matter are those that deeply protect federalism by assuring that an appeal to the people of many states and regions through your policies, not necessarily where you show up to campaign, but through your policies, you have to appeal to the people of many states and regions of the country is necessary for a candidate to win the presidency. If you want to win the presidency, you might want to give some thought to Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. The electoral system ensures that all 50 states matter because federally democratic elections in each state determine which candidate receives each state's electoral votes. And this forces candidates to seek a national consensus by taking account of the values, policy preferences, and opinions of those who live in rural areas as well as urban areas, in coastal areas as well as in the heartland of America. As one scholar puts it, having to go to the people, not as an undifferentiated mass, but in their states, makes candidates aware of, if not always sympathetic to, the whole array of interests articulated principally at the local level. There's a big difference between the people of North Dakota and their values and the people of California and their values. Hollywood values versus what one commentator derisively refers to as sagebrush values. I like sagebrush. I like sagebrush values. I'll take that as a compliment. There's a huge difference. The people of California don't want to be governed by the people of Wyoming and the people of Wyoming or North Dakota don't want to be governed by the people of California. So let's look at some electoral maps. This is the New York Times uh, map of the 2016 election. President Trump won the popular vote in 30 of 50 states and in over 2,600 counties from coast to coast, while Hillary Clinton won only 20 states plus the District of Columbia and less than 500 counties. In the counties, Trump won by a 5 to 1 margin. More than 2,600 counties for Trump, less than 500 counties 
for uh, Mrs. Clinton. Hillary was the choice of the wealthy and heavily populated east and west coastal regions and a few urban areas in between. Whereas President Tr Trump was the choice of 30 states and 2,600 counties covering the entire expanse of America. This electoral map, I think, is even more revealing. Uh, Trump wins the Electoral College by a comfortable, he said it was the largest margin ever, you know. It wasn't the largest margin ever, but it was a com what he meant was it was a comfortable margin. It was a victory. Victory. Uh, he won the vote in the Electoral College by a comfortable majority of 304 electoral votes to 227 for Mrs. Clinton, basically a 55% majority. Another way of looking at this, Hillary Clinton won a plurality, not a majority, but a 48% plurality of the so-called popular vote by 2,864,974 votes. Let's call it a 3 million vote lead over Trump. But if, we but if we subtract her margin in California of 4,269,978 votes, Trump actually wins the popular vote in the other 49 states by approximately 1.5 million votes. And if we subtract Clinton's margin in both California and New York of a little over 6 million votes, Trump wins the other 48 states by more than 3 million votes. Now, I don't say this to imply that New York and California don't count. They very much count to determine who wins the electoral votes in California and New York. Rather, my purpose is to just show you that two large coastal states can dominate a national election for the presidency. And who does that remind you of? My new favorite founding father. That is exactly what Gunning Bedford of Delaware feared in 1787 when he told the delegates from the large states that he could not allow his state, Delaware, to submit to an enormous and monstrous influence of a few large population states like uh, Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania. Now, clearly the best case scenario for our, for our national unity is when a presidential candidate wins both an electoral vote majority and a popular vote majority, as President Obama did in both 2008 and 2012. However, in elections like that of 2016, in which one candidate wins only a popular vote plurality and another wins a strong consensus in the states and counties together with a solid electoral vote majority, I think the electoral system created by the Constitution works well. It's not perfect, but as Hamilton said, it's excellent. Whatever your views about President Trump's character and populist agenda, when you look at the remarkable 2016 electoral map of the United States, depicting how the counties voted, it is clear that President Trump was the nationwide consensus. He didn't get the most votes but he was the nationwide consensus of the American presidential election of 2016. And by the way, you know, if, if we change the rules, we change the strategy. If we say it's a national popular vote majority that you need, then candidates campaign differently. Can, Trump knows he's gonna lose California by four million votes. He doesn't care about California he knows he's going to lose. So in an electoral vote system, he doesn't care. In a popular vote system, he would be out there trying to beat the drums to get as many Republicans in California to come out to the polls. Because losing by 2 million votes is a lot different from losing by 4 million. He might have been able to generate more popular votes. I don't know. We don't know what would happen because that wasn't our system. But if you think about the World Series, if, if we just said, team with the most runs in seven games wins the World Series, you're ahead 10 nothing. you're pinch hitting, you're trying to run up the score. You'd like to win 20 nothing rather than 10 nothing. You're not, you're not resting your regulars, you're going with your closer, you're going with your best pinch hitters, you're trying to run up the score as much as possible. Whereas if it's for a first team to win four games, you take the 10 nothing victory, rest your closer because you'd like to win game two. So is this system obsolete? And I'll, I'll close with, with this. Is this system obsolete, as many of the critics assert? They say, well, yeah, Duncan, if we, you know, if we needed Delaware and Connecticut and Rhode Island, we had to give in to the small states. But you know, that's done. That's done and gone with. Once they ratified the Constitution, that's over. It's no, longer, uh, you know, it's no longer relevant. The point of the critics seemed to be that the political compromises made in 1789 to create a constitutional union are no longer necessary. <coughs> to preserve that constitutional union. So well, here's what I do in con law. 
Uh, I asked my students to assume that the Constitution had an expiration date, as Jefferson wanted. Jefferson basically said, you know, the existing generation has no right to govern the next generation. He wanted the Constitution to expire every 20 years. But, you know, let's say that he prevailed and the Constitution as we know it today is about to expire, say on December 31, 2020. The 50 states will become free and independent states unless all 50 states can be convinced to ratify a new Constitution. Constitution's gone, there is no Constitution, there is no United States of America once we get to December 31, 2020. Just 15 sovereign states. So I asked my students, and, and I ask you here today, to role play being delegates from various states to the second constitutional convention of 2020. If you represented California or New York at the second constitutional convention of 2020, what would you want in terms of composition of the national government, the Senate and the election of the president? What would be the price of California's vote to ratify, of New York's vote to ratify? But now imagine you represent Wyoming or Nebraska or South Dakota or North Dakota at the convention. Now what do you want? Remember, if all 50 states can't agree to ratify the new constitution, we have to come up with something that works for everybody. It's like having a big family and saying, what do you want for dinner tonight? All right? Curry, steak, let's have spaghetti. All right, everybody likes spaghetti. If all 50 states can't agree to ratify the new constitution, we won't have a United States of America. We need a compromise that works for all 50 states, small, large, and in between, red, blue, and purple. Now, we've got hot button issues today uh, that I, I don't think we could. I don't think all the king's horses and all the king's men could put the United States back together again if we were in this situation. I mean, what are we going to do in the Constitution about abortion, about same-sex marriage, about gun rights, about the scope of religious liberty, okay? So it's not clear to me that, you know, we could agree to a plan. But let's set aside the culture war. Let's just focus on these structural provisions of, you know, how we're going to set up national elections. If a compromise acceptable for ratification by all 50 states could be worked out, and I'm not sure it could, we are very divided today. It would probably look a lot like the Great Compromise of 1789. Larger states would get an advantage in the House, representation by population in the House. Smaller states would get equal representation in the Senate. And there'd be some type of compromise as to how the president is elected. I'm not sure if we need elect presidential electors. It might be enough to just have electoral votes that automatically get counted once the election is over. And in fact, the current allocation of electoral votes, California gets 55 electoral votes and Wyoming gets only three. I think, I, I think we could sit down and put together about 10 or 11 states that collectively don't have as many electoral votes as California gets. Is, in my opinion, too favorable to the large population states. If I represented Wyoming or Nebraska or North Dakota, at the second constitutional convention of 2020, I'd want smaller states, I'd want both a ceiling and a floor. No more than 30, no fewer than 10, or no fewer than 15. So California gets 30, Wyoming gets 15. They'd have to get a few cows. They, they don't have enough bison to cast those votes, but they'd work it out, right? That's what I would want. I would want small states to be better protected. Now, I don't know if I'd prevail. We might just have to cave and go with the original system, but I don't think the electoral vote system is obsolete at all. Small population states in flyover country would be crazy to submit to a national government under the supremacy clause dominated by large population centers in, hand, in a handful of states. I love California's beaches, but I don't want to be governed by California values. Okay, and California, <laughs> I don't know if they love our planes, uh, but I know they don't want to be governed by Nebraska or North Dakota or Wyoming values either. So as one scholar of the electoral system has explained, our system prevents local needs from being ignored, controls dangerous factions, and requires a balancing of interests. It is more relevant in today's bitterly divided America than it was in 1789. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Gordon. Thank you. Um, I only want to talk for a couple minutes because I want to make sure we leave lots of time for questions. Um, 
It's always a pleasure to talk to the Federalist Society, um, or as President Trump would call it, central casting. <laughs> um, I, I do want to make a couple of uh, key points. Um, there are uh, uh, liberals, progressives out there who think we ought to do away with the, the way the Senate is proportioned or do away with the electoral problem. Uh, I'm not one of them. Uh, I think that uh, there's a, a great deal of value in having sagebrush values and Hollywood values represented. Uh, however, uh, I do think, as a, a person who believes in not just checks but also balances, I think the current system is a bit out of balance. And I, I, I think we can agree it's the, the current system is not what the framers intended, right? They certainly didn't expect that elections would be decided in the Electoral College. They expected it would often go to the House. Um, things have changed. Uh, the two-party system arguably is the most powerful force now in Washington. Uh, I think it has created a corrosion of Article I that concerns me a great deal and that I hope concerns the Federal Society as well. Um, but the proportions have changed, right? I mean, I, I think well, I think if we could go back to the original proportions where you've got the state, uh, the largest state to the smallest state was a 1 to 12 ratio, right? Um, Madison and others didn't, didn't like the fact that there was uh, equal sovereignty for, for states in the Senate or equal uh, suffrage, uh, but they viewed it as a necessary, I don't know if they said evil, but it was, it was necessary to get the, it wouldn't have, I agree it wouldn't have happened otherwise, okay? Today it is 1 to 70. Uh, we are a different nation just in terms of size, and, and <laughs> I've actually figured out, I just figured out while you were talking, how to fix the Electoral College problem <laughs> with, without changing the Constitution at all. Um, and it is by doing away with the Apportionment Act of 1911. Uh, the first Congress had around between 58 and 62 congressmen, right? Um, it got bigger, the nation got bigger, uh, and at some point, uh, toward the beginning of the 20th century, they said, you know what, this house is just, we're, we're, there's 330 million of us today. Um, they said, it, it's not sustainable to have us growing at this rate based on, the, on how we apportion our, and so they capped the House of Representatives at 435. Uh, that makes sense, I think. I think it would be unwieldy, well, arguably unwieldy otherwise. Um, and you could say that the same uh, issue has led to this um, disproportion between the states. In the entire state of, I remember visiting Wyoming when I was a kid with my family. And I remember how beautiful it was. And I remember the point where my brother turned to me and said, where are all the people, <laughs> right? There are no people in, in Wyoming. There's, I guess there's some. Uh, Here's a fun fact, which I think is still true. In the Very entire, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, in the entire state of Wyoming, there are two escalators. <laughs> think about that. They're both in Casper. So if we were to uh, allocate senators by the number of escalators in your state, Wyoming would still get the same number, right? They'd get two. <laughs> There are 12% of the country lives in California, right? If you want to talk about who's aggrieved, why on earth would, if we were doing this, uh, you know, talk about it, small states and large states, why on earth, California's, I, I mean, I would feel like I was getting pretty screwed. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late Senator Moynihan, said this is going to have to be addressed somehow in the next century. And I think he's probably right. I think that that just as we address the, the size of the House, I think we're gonna to have to figure out something to do about the Senate um, and the Electoral College. I think that with the Electoral College, if you did away with the Apportionment Act, and now California would have, I, I mean, you'd have 800 members of Congress or something, uh, but you would have something closer to uh, evenness in terms of the Electoral College. The one to 70 ratio uh, wouldn't be nearly as, as damaging as it is, as it is now. It's, it's the combination of that cap, I think, uh, that is, is putting it out of whack. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is uh, I enjoyed your article. One of the things I, I noticed about it, and I noticed this about your talk too, um, you rarely refer to we the people. When you say we the people, you almost always add we the people of the states. 
uh, which is not a phrase that occurs in the Constitution. The Constitution talks about we the people. Um, there are certain uh, bedrock principles over time, and there are certain bedrock trends that we've observed in the history of our Constitution. Before the Civil War, I think those two bedrock principles were popular sovereignty and representative government, republicanism uh, writ large. Uh, after the Civil War, I would say the two bedrock principles that have been added are equality, equal citizenship, and national enforcement, right? The 14th Amendment, the first thing the 14th Amendment does is it says to states, you don't get to decide who your own citizens are anymore. If you're a US citizen and you live in that state, you're a citizen of that state, automatically. Um, states are not what they used to be. That's part of what the 17th Amendment is about. 17th Amendment wasn't this like, you know, drunken rage of progressivism. There's a reason why uh, state governments were, I mean, look at the history, but there was a great deal of corruption in the choice of US senators, and it was happening at the legislative level. Um, over time, states are not what they were. And so I think that having a one to 70 ratio uh, for state governments as state governments uh, is out of balance. It may be a check, but it's not a balanced one. Uh, I, do, I, I do think that um, sagebrush values and Hollywood values should both be represented, uh, but I think that population should have something to do with it. If you look at um, one of the debates that's going on now in Washington about guns, something like 90% of the country, literally, and like 60% of Republicans favor some kind of expanded background checks. Can't even get a hearing in the Senate. Um, at some point, this is not sustainable. I don't know whether it's in my lifetime or not, but at some point, uh, people will say, there's no one living in Wyoming anymore. The three people that live there have died. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's no longer 12%, but let's say 25% of the country lives in California or lives in Texas, right? Eventually, that's not sustainable. And the Supreme Court has rightly, I think, ruled that at every other level of government, at the state level, you can't do that. It's one person, one vote in, in every state. Um, they couldn't, if we wanted to do, every county gets, gets two state senators to send to the state, you couldn't do it, it's unconstitutional. Um, if we're going to depart from the one person, one vote principle, you should have a good reason, and I do think that there, it's possible to go too far. And when we've gone too far in the past, we've usually found ways uh, to ameliorate the problem. That's it. Questions for Professor Duncan? Yes. I had one that came to mind that I, I guess you can touch on. But I grew up in Iowa, uh -huh. which was one of the largest federal income, basically the differentiation between what they paid in federal government taxes mm -hmm. and what was brought mm -hmm. in. Right was one of the highest, I think, behind only South Carolina, yeah. um, and now I live in Minnesota, right. which is the exact opposite. Right. They pay a significant amount of right. money to Iowa, so right. both sure can do well in the presidential race. How do you, I, I guess, I don't have an answer to it. I know that that seems to be in the background of this debate a lot of how do you balance yeah. out that. Yeah, so I The only reason that makes sense is in terms of right. the president's getting left. Uh, it, well, it's clear that, that small states have more power, in, at least in the Senate, and since you need both the House and the Senate to pass legislation, that means that effectively the small states have a veto of the legislation, and they sometimes use that veto uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to help themselves out economically. I, I think the, the long-term solution is taking the Tenth Amendment a lot more seriously and asking yourself, where is the federal welfare power under the enumerated powers in the Constitution? You know, what happened is during the New Deal era, Congress grabbed lots more power, regulatory power under the Commerce Clause and lots more spending power under the spending power, under the tax and spending clauses. Um, and so to me, the, if we're going to have peace, I don't know how we can have peace. I, I don't know that we can amend the Constitution to give California twice as much power in the electoral college as they have. It would almost mandate a blue presidency of California got even more electoral votes than they have. 
I think we may have to start talking about not a war secession, but some type of, of peaceful rethinking about whether 50 states that are so different in their values can truly live together. But if we can live together, I think that I, I call it the Pax Federalis, that if, if peace is possible, it's by shrinking the influence of the federal government and the supremacy clause on a lot of issues. But California regulate Californians and why the people of Wyoming regulate the people of Wyoming. And that way you get government closer to home. We can have, as I call it, 50 shades of federalism. 50 different approaches, <laughs> I know, I know. 50 different approaches to government, where California can have one shopping cart of government, and Nebraska can have a very different shopping cart of government, and the people of Nebraska are happy with the Nebraska shopping cart, and the people of California are happy with the California shopping cart. So shrinking, you know, the federal government still needs to do the things that are truly national, but shrinking much of the power of the federal government and restoring power to the states. Abortion is a perfect issue. Like uh, Roe versus Wade is overruled, the issue goes back to the states. And New York, they've already decided they're going to have a, a, a state law that goes way beyond Roe versus Wade. And, you know, Nebraska or, or North Dakota might prohibit abortion. Different approaches for different people with different values, I think, is the only way we're going to have peace in the long run because we are so divided. Even on first principles. You know, what's good and what's evil? Right? Is, is abortion good? Does it's health care for women, or is abortion evil? Because it's taking the life of innocent children, and we have different, fundamentally different approaches to these issues. So, yes? Um, during your talk, you seem to speak as if everyone in California has the same view, right. and everyone in North Dakota has the same right. view, which is not true. Of, of course, course, of course. This is 60, 40, 51, 49. Um, wouldn't this be solved if um, each state Instead of having a winner take all right. voting on election system, we'll have a more representative. Uh, you know, that issue is for the states to decide. The Constitution allows the states to decide how to allocate presidential electors. Um, my state, I think stupid, um, has gone with that system, a uh, district system, and, and so we occasionally will split our electoral votes. I would love if California did that. Right? Imagine if California won with that proportional system, then Hillary Clinton won without 155 or more. She probably would have won about 40 election votes in California. People in California don't want to do that because they know they're giving up power in the presidential election. Um, I suppose a constitutional amendment might, might do something like that. It might basically say, that, yeah, the elections are in the states and the, and the electoral votes will, will be allocated based upon the percentage of votes in each state. I'm not sure how that would come out. You could try to do the math and pass the elections and try to figure out how many elections would change by virtue of that. But for me, federal, the beautiful thing about federalism, see, if I'm in California and I have safe brush values and you know, and we've got a real healthy system of federalism, then what do I do? Move to Wyoming. I foot vote. Yes, yes I vote with my feet. And the beautiful thing about foot voting is it's immediately successful. I want lower taxes, I move to Texas. I want less regulation, I move to Texas. And guess what? I get what I want, just like that. So that's the beauty of federalism. And I mentioned it in the thing. It's really looking at, at citizens as consumers of government. And government has to compete for citizens. If you say high taxes and high benefits, you get people who like that. If you say low taxes and low benefits, you get people who like that. If you say abortion on demand throughout 40 weeks of pregnancy, you get people who like that. If you say pro-life laws, you get people who like that. So that's why I love federalism. You get you can govern get governed closer to home by people who are closer to you and to your values in whatever state you may, you may be. And because of the 14th Amendment, which says that citizens choose states, states don't choose citizens. If I don't like the state I'm a citizen of, California, I can move to North Dakota and become a North Dakotan like that and spend two years' salary on winter jackets. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That's a great. That is a great point. And, and we are not 100 percent in any state. It's 60 40 in just about every state, I think, or even closer than that. Other, other, yes. So I understand your argument correctly. We don't believe the population of any individual state should determine how many, or you know, outside the minimum, it, should, it shouldn't matter what the voting power per voter is correct in terms of electoral college influence. 
Um, well, right now, the way the Electoral College is determined is number of, of House seats plus number of Senate seats. Right. So, why so it's, it's, it's almost, it almost is a, a, a proportional system. As California gets 55 electoral votes, their, their House seats are based on, on population. And so it's a little bit favorable to small states, but it's still heavily advantages large states. If I had, if I were, if James Madison had come to me and said, hey, Duncan, help me out here with the electoral vote system, I would have suggested, they, they were thinking in terms of equal state representation. They didn't think the electoral college was going to decide on this. I would say, well, either it should be 10 electoral votes per state, or we should, you know, we should have a, a floor and a ceiling. So yeah, I'm not into population. I think that what you need to do, presidents, if presidents want to be presidents of the entire nation, not just presidents of high population areas, then they should have to run a truly national campaign. And you know, and so to me, the, the beauty of the electoral system is it requires a president to get this kind of national consensus from coast to coast. Can't just run up the score in a few, in a few But isn't that what's happening now in swing states? Don't presidential candidates only campaign in states and actually plan the election? Yeah, I don't care where they campaign, sure. right? I mean, you know, nobody campaigns in Nebraska. But if you know, Donald Trump had run a pro-choice campaign, said, I'm going to increase Roe versus Wade, he would not have won the state of Nebraska. Even though he doesn't campaign there, he has to take account of the values of the people in Nebraska and Wyoming and North Dakota and Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, and if you don't do that, then, you know, then you're not going to win the presidency. I guess my first question is kind of leading that it, it, this is kind of invoking a constitutional crisis meltdown. But what, for example, if population doesn't matter as much, theoretically, the Senate and House of Reps could elect to have a state of one person getting two senators and one representative. It's proportional. And that person, that, that state of one right. would have significantly more influence than. Right. Yeah, I don't know how one person could serve, could be two senators. But, right. you know, I mean, I, I think, I think the Trinity has managed to handle that, but I, I think short of that. But yeah, I, I think the next time the Dems win control, I think you're going to see uh, a good chance that D.C. becomes a state. I think he has a good chance that Puerto Rico becomes a state because they can't take away states of equal suffrage under the Constitution, but they can increase states and almost guarantee another four, another four senators. You know, and some people talk talk about splitting other states up, but Republicans can do that as well. Then they come back in and we end up with five Wyomings, east, west, north, south, and in between Wyoming. I guess that's why I'm concerned with the political gamemanship that could take place. Right. Yeah, no, I worry about it too. I, I worry about it too. And you know, I don't and I think both sides are capable of doing that. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thanks a lot. It was a great turnout. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article 1 initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.